I feel, I feel like, I, I was going to say I feel, but maybe that's presumptuous. I hope I'm amongst friends. <laughs> I'll, I can't do this now because it starts at the beginning. It says thank you, Felina, but you haven't introduced me, so I can't thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was in case I, that was in case I forgot. Well, um, good evening, good evening, everybody, and thanks for spreading yourselves out at least to make it uh, look a bit more respectable. I say I'm clearly a big draw on these occasions, and and apologies to those who I told this uh, to before and those who were at J.D. Hill's lecture, but I'd like to tell my story. My friend uh, used to run, uh, visit Britain, who, uh, it's a true story, went up, uh, was invited to a sort of village hall somewhere in Aberdeenshire, which for those who don't know, the British Isles is kind of at the back of beyond in in Scotland, and um, he felt he ought to go to give this evening talk, and uh, he flew up had to get a taxi out into the wilds, had to have the taxi wait for him because uh, it was the only way to get back. And uh, got into this cold village hall and uh, there was only one other person there. So we sort of kicked around for a while and he said, well, unfortunate, you know, obviously nobody else is going to come so we might as well knock it on the head and I'll just get back in my taxi. And this guy, and I'm sorry, Ian, because I really can't do it. Cause maybe you've heard me do this before anyway. And this, uh, this Aberdonian said, oh, no, no, I really want to hear what you've got to say. So this one person, audience of one, made him give his talk. Um, and then Julie asked the question at the end of it. And he said, well, thank you very much. I'm oh, now going to get in my taxi. At which point this guy said, no, I'm the other speaker. So, uh, and then made him sit through it, but there we go. Um, <laughs> can, can I acknowledge all our distinguished guests this evening? I'm trying to work out which staff are here um, to, to carry favour and support me and which, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 which are here to catch me out. Um, and can I also begin by uh, acknowledging the uh, Wajak Nunga people as the traditional custodians of this place and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and as Many of you will know this is an important place for Noongar people. The limestone bar that used to go across the river here was somewhere where they hunted and fished, and indeed the uh, removal of that bar was uh, a cause of some stress, and uh, therefore it's still an, an important place uh, for our, uh, our Noongar um, nation, and uh, I say we pay our respects. Uh, Fremantle also, of course, the first point of arrival for many migrants, as is evidenced by the welcome walls out there. and. Um, but we do obviously acknowledge uh, the Aboriginal people of Australia as probably, and almost beyond argument now, the longest settled civilization on the planet. And one of the questions that I will ask uh, later on is how collections can reflect that and sometimes what the physicality uh, of collections is. So let's just do a bit of um, oh, oh, bad start. Um, so the origins of museums, uh, obviously when we trace the history of museums, we track back to classical Greece and the idea of the Temple of the Muses. These were places of art, culture, learning, and collections were actually perhaps incidental to this. And again, perhaps we should remember this because this is one of the uh, uh, moves we're making. I mean, just uh, signed up our deal with, with Yuri Akin, um, trying to bring, if you like, uh, oh, do me, uh, drama back into the Temple of the Muses. And these are the, the nine muses and if I hadn't got so many slides, I'd tell you who they all are, but uh, uh, let's move swiftly on. So this, again, will be familiar to many of my museum colleagues. These were some of the ideas of the, the first uh, museums. Uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, arguably the earliest pictorial record of a natural history cabinet uh, of uh, Ferrante Imperato's Dell'Historia uh, Naturale in Naples. And um, it's really interesting because as well as the collections, uh, you'll see on the, the left-hand side all the kind of cupboards and the shelves and the little niches um, to put things. The books uh, lying open uh, to show that uh, he's really on top of things. And um, uh, I say little pigeonholes for all the specimens there. It reminds me very much of Di Jones's office, actually. But... Uh, um, Moving somewhat on, uh, this uh, is the other, uh, the other one that uh, is famously uh, um, uh, featured, and this is the uh, cabinet of Ole Wurm, uh, or Olaus Wormius, 1588 to 1654. And um, again, you can see these 
17th century cabinets filled with preserved animals, horns, tusks, skeletons, minerals, and fascinating man-made objects. Uh, sculptures wondrously old, wondrously fine, or wondrously small. Um, clockwork automata. And obviously they also had uh, mythical creatures. So um, uh, amongst other things, Worm's collection included a woolly fern, thought to be a plant, sheep, fabulous creature. Um, and these were very kind of popular at the time. But I think he was credited as the person who did identify the narwhal's tusk as not being the tusk of a, a unicorn. So uh, things had moved on somewhat from there. And then, of course, there was the Age of Enlightenment, which, depending on your uh, viewpoint, uh, probably had its roots um, slightly before the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, some would say that Newton's uh, uh, Principia Mathematica uh, in 1860, uh, 1687 was maybe the start of that. And um, this was um, the age of advancing knowledge. It promoted science, intellectual interchange, and opposed superstition. Um, it formed the roots of the British Museum, uh, Sir Hans Sloane's collection, which is very much about trying to understand the world. Uh, was well, it was gifted to the nation on condition that the nation would provide a home for it, and of course, it duly did. Um, and later on, I guess, museums became seen as public good and something um, to improve society, almost uh, a form of, of social engineering. So, I don't know why it does that. Why collect? Um, well, I'll just go back there actually. Um, collecting is a ubiquitous human activity spanning all ages, all kinds of societies, uh, and studying of it can reveal an extraordinary range of connections between the world of things uh, and the human world of ideas, values, and meanings. And there's a lot of debate about what museums are really about. Are they about things or are they about ideas? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, it's interesting, actually, in doing a bit of research on this, I also found that, that there are a lot of negative and undesirable traits associated with, with collecting. And apparently, it's a sign of avoidance behavior. So you collect things uh, uh, you know, rather than getting on with what you should have done. Uh, it's sociopathic. So you kind of uh, you know, engage with your collections rather than having to talk to anybody else. And uh, clearly, all the people who would have been here this evening are back with their collections. Um, uh, management of unconscious fears by sort of gathering things around you. Um, and my, my favorite one, uh, uh, unmet social needs. Um, you know, if you can't get people to be nice to you, maybe your collections will be nice to you. And, and my favorite one was the compensation of unfulfilled sexual desires. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking at our curators in a whole different light having, uh, having read that, I have to say. Um, but I will uh, argue that in the museum context, at least there are many good reasons that we collect. Um, but it's important to consider why do we collect what we collect. Uh, what is revealed by the ways we accumulate, hoard, and display, and indeed disperse our collections. Uh, and how do these things change across cultures? And ironically, though I am making the case for collections, um, I caution against the fetishizing of them or, or of their taking over the museum. Draw breath. Um, for I believe that collections are not the museum's core business. Uh, they are not an end in themselves. Um, they are one of the tools that enable the real core business of a public museum, which is delivering public value uh, around issues of culture, identity, environment, and confidence. And dare I say it, collections uh, are useless if they're not used. How they're used could be many different ways, obviously. Uh, this is our mission, which I'm sure most people in this room could uh, recite uh, in their sleep. Um, but uh, I believe that if collections are the heart of our mission, then public value is our soul. And uh, so you hear about people talking about museums and collections for core business, but it is really about uh, using those collections. Um, collections and meaning, who makes the meaning? Well, we don't actually run uh, art galleries here, but obviously um, I've got a bit of form in those areas. And probably above all, art collections are something that uh, people could accuse of being uh, subjective. And I, Apart from anything else, it's a good excuse to show this uh, cartoon, which is one of my favorites. But, um, and I know that all collecting is subjective, uh, but art galleries reflect taste and connoisseurship, uh, an elitist word that I abhor, I have to say, uh, whereas I think museums, if done properly, uh, should provide a more rounded account of our world. Not objective, not neutral, uh, but at least based 
on uh, a reasonable and a detailed exploration of our world. And art can do the same, but I don't think to the same extent. But sometimes those worlds collide, of course, and uh, natural science objects uh, take on um, monetary values, artistic values. Uh, this is uh, the glory of the sea, Cone, Conus uh, Gloria Maris, which uh, for many, many years was, uh, uh, well, probably still is, but certainly was one of the most sought after natural history objects uh, on the commercial market. And then, of course, uh, at the other uh, end, there is the value of nature, as I say, what, what uh, our collections tell us about the natural world and what, in fact, uh, they uh, do to help us understand what can happen to the world when things go wrong. And, of course, this is um, uh, an illustration of one of the few extant remains of a dodo. This is the, uh, uh, an illustration of the one in the Oxford University Museum. Um, the, the Oxford University Museum uh, has, a, has a, a, a head and a foot. Uh, there's a skull in Copenhagen, and um, there was, um, uh, I think there's, well, there's supposed to be an egg in East London, but I don't think anybody's ever proved that at all. Uh, that's East London in, in uh, the Eastern Cape, not in, uh, not in the UK. Um, this actually, this, this Oxford one, there's this, this great sort of story about how, um, you know, it was moth-eaten and somebody threw it on a fire and somebody rescued the head and the foot. Uh, we actually think that probably isn't true anymore, but it was just that these were the only bits that were uh, uh, rescuable. But this is the only bit of soft tissue, and this is uh, a museum. Uh, it, it actually went to the Tradescans at the Ashmolean Museum, so it's now in the uh, Oxford University Museum. And uh, it's one of, say, two places in the world that you can actually uh, see and um, study uh, this now extinct animal. Collections put us on, in touch with the past, so we collect to discover our origins, that of our society and our environment. Um, and these unassuming uh, bone beads from a Devil's Lair uh, near the Margaret River are probably both historic and artistic. Uh, they represent the adornment of Aboriginal people who lived in WA Southwest up to 20,000 years ago. And again, these are the kind of things, probably rather more prosaic, uh, the Ruthven uh, printing press, uh, the first um, uh, newspapers in Western Australia were actually produced on this press. Apparently, uh, commercial printing ink was not available, so a substitute ink was made with suit and mutton fat. So uh, goodness knows what the newspapers smelt like when they came off it. Uh, the rollers were dressed with treacle and glue, and uh, it could knock out uh, 50 copies an hour of, uh, of, of the newspapers, Fremantle Observer, Perth Gazette, and the Western Australian Journal, um, first published in 1831. And again, a very important moment, I suggest, for WA. Natural history items. So we're kind of going through a, a conspectus of the sort of things that we collect. Natural history items, key to understanding our environment and our rare megamouth uh, shark. Uh, just around the corner, uh, was Worcestershire Manger in 1988. At the time, it was only the third uh, specimen known. Um, and again, uh, if you've not seen it, do go out and have a look. Uh, Ian McLeod in the front row here has uh, spent a good part of the last, uh, probably the last two years actually, um, reconditioning it, restoring it in uh, a new solution. It's now stored in, in glycerol instead of uh, ethanol and looking very well on it. Uh, and it illustrates another uh, dimension to what museums do, of course, which is conserving these collections, which is a big responsibility. We also um, collect the, you know, the, the beautiful, the exceptional, and uh, coming soon, coming very soon next week, uh, in fact, is the unveiled exhibition, which I hope you all come and see in the, um, in the Perth Museum. That's uh, on loan to us from the, the V&A. And this has made us start to think about uh, our contemporary collecting and how we uh, collect today, because we're going to be showing 200 years of uh, incredible wedding dresses and other wedding regalia uh, from the V&A, augmenting it with our own collection. Uh, but we've also um, commissioned a, a piece from local WA designer Aurelio Costarella, uh, which will become part of our collection uh, as a result of this. So actually. Um, you know, in this sense, that whole idea of making meaning, we're creating meaning ourselves by, by commissioning a piece. And 
as well as um, the beautiful and exceptional, there's the courageous and exceptional, and in this case, uh, uh, Lieutenant Frederick William Bell, the first Western Australian to be awarded the Victoria Cross. Um, in the Boer War, uh, Bell was born in Perth in 1875, and uh, in 1901, under heavy fire, uh, was riding to safety when he saw a dismounted uh, soldier, um, obviously in peril. He returned to pick him up, and uh, his horse fell under the weight of two men. Bell insisted the soldier uh, take the horse, and then he gave covering fire. He was awarded a VC, and um, that VC is now in the collection of the WA Museum, which is quite an unusual thing, because I'm sure you're aware most uh, Australian VCs are in the Australian War Memorial, so we're very, uh, very proud of that one. Uh, and of course, you can't talk about exceptional collections down here, really, without talking about Australia too. Uh, and again, I suspect there's very little I need to say about that. But it is interesting because, uh, like every uh, collection item, it carries many messages with it. Of course, it's something about national pride. There's definitely something about Western Australian pride there. Um, but there's also something about technology, the design of the famous wing keel that actually uh, uh, arguably caused it to win. Now, I have to say, there are some things that I do find rather strange in museums. Not everything is to everybody's taste, and um, forgive me if this is being un-Australian of me, but uh, I've never quite understood the attraction of Farlap uh, in the Melbourne Museum. Um, Farlap, of course, um, I think won the Melbourne Cup only once, but uh, did win something like 51 races, and uh, as a result, his... Um, his hide as is uh, now stuffed and in the Melbourne Museum. His skeleton is in Tapapa because he was a New Zealand uh, horse. And his heart is in the uh, Australian uh, National Museum in Canberra. And uh, for the 150th uh, uh, running of the Melbourne Cup, they actually brought together the skeleton and the, um, and the hide uh, in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, apparently they weren't, they weren't allowed to borrow the heart because the conservators wouldn't let them, honestly. Um, but, um, you know, this is, notwithstanding the big temporary exhibition, this is the Melbourne Museum's most popular exhibit. I don't get it, but, you know, the fact is that some people do, and that's the thing we have to remember, is that different things mean different things to different people. And I guess with that sort of conspectus of the sort of things that we have in our collections, we set about defining what it was that we, uh, we need to do to actually um, not objectify, because that would be the wrong word, but to actually look at our collections, uh, categorize them, but also uh, look at where we should be collecting and what were the themes. And I always refer this as the, the Kerry Stokes question, because Kerry Stokes, who knows us very well, who has lent very generously to uh, the museums here, uh, so he's not a man who doesn't know museums, but uh, one of the first things he ever said to me when I arrived here was, well, you know, you've got a difficult job on here because I'm not really sure what the museum is about because it's got a bit of this and a bit of, you know, a bit of Aboriginal, a bit of... Um, maritime history, it's got natural history, it does research, it does education. What's it all about? I actually think that's its strength, by the way, but I think it's something that we need to articulate. So we sat on these three themes which have become the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the um, mainstay of our thinking about the new museum in Perth, but also about the whole museum. So what are we about and how do our collections relate it? So it's about these three things, being Western Australian, uh, discovering Western Australia, uh, and exploring the world. Oh, too many buttons. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone one too far there. So being Western Australian, uh, it should be a state museum for all Western Australians. It must deal with issues of identity, diversity, community, understanding ourselves, understanding each other. Uh, and it is about a state that has both the oldest uh, settled uh, civilization in the world, but also probably one of the most rapidly diversifying ones. And uh, as I say, to paraphrase the SBS tagline, which I wish we'd thought of it before they did, we've got 2.2 million stories and, uh, and counting, maybe not 7 billion, but still quite a lot. Uh, and every Western Australian has got a story to tell. And I think one of the things that I want to start out with is the fact that not all collections are physical or original objects. So the Dwyer collection of photographs, um, I'll talk about a bit later, becomes an authentic collection in cataloging and documenting an important part in WA's history. The archive collections reveal the cargoes. I see um, um, 
colleagues uh, you know, who've done an awful lot of work on the passenger registers uh, and the like, these are all part of the collections and some people call them metadata. I think they're all part of the collections. Uh, but some collections are stories and memories. And this is particularly important with Aboriginal people who regard themselves as custodians of their heritage and their law. And this can mean physical objects, obviously it does in some cases, but it can equally mean dreaming stories or a relationship with country. And you hear academics talk about intangible heritage to bracket these collections, but that's another term that I really hate. Uh, and I hate it because um, you know, a dreaming story is something extremely tangible to an Aboriginal person, and we shouldn't um, put our own value judgments on that. So I'm delighted that the museum has just signed a memorandum of, un a memorandum of understanding with the Aboriginal uh, company Yiriakin to create and perform uh, Aboriginal cultural events in the museum. And this is one way to acknowledge that not all collections are physical, but also to ensure that our representation of Aboriginal culture is both historic and contemporary. And this is actually the image for uh, a show they did called Carla Katjin, uh, uh, which was part of the Awesome Festival at the museum earlier this, uh, this year. Being Western Australian, so in the same vein as the beads I showed earlier, these bone points are from Devil's Lair in the Margaret River. And like the beads, these are dated somewhere between 12 and 20,000 years. But the oldest bone points, unfortunately I don't have a photograph of them from the cave, are 43,000 years old. And gradually we seem to be pushing back uh, the date that we think that uh, Aboriginal people uh, actually inhabited uh, WA, certainly in the Kimberley now, some of the rock art, I believe, again, has been dated back to around about 40,000 uh, years ago. And, you know, how do we know this? We know it from collections. This is where the evidence is, and the fact that we've actually got them allows us to find these things out. I'm on really shaky ground now with uh, all my colleagues in the, uh, in the room, so, I, so I'll keep it simple, you'll be glad to know. Um, but this is uh, the celebrated uh, de Flaming uh, plate, which marks one incident in the long period of contact between the Dutch uh, um, sailors of the VOC and the WA coast. Uh, de Flaming's instructions for his voyage of discovery to the west coast of the Southland uh, specifically suggested pewter plates as landmarks. Uh, and apparently he did erect a variety of signs uh, along the coast, but I believe this is the only one that we've ever found. Um, looking a bit hesitantly over there in case somebody shakes their head and says, "Not any, anybody want to dissent from that? Um, and uh, this was actually... Um, um, in 1697, uh, the uh, upper steersman, uh, Michael Blum, uh, on the uh, Gelvink uh, uh, de Flamings ship, uh, discovered Dirk Hartog's original plate, which was the one there from 1616 that we'll be celebrating 400 years of uh, shortly. Um, and uh, he actually, uh, apparently it was in a state of some disrepair, so he removed the plate and replaced it with this one, which he actually repeated the inscription from the Hartog plate and then added uh, their own inscription too. Uh, the Hartog plate is now in um, the Rijksmuseum, uh, and, and I heard a kind of uh, outrageous story that, uh, that is not in very good condition, but I don't know if that's true at all. That's the kind of, that's the kind of thing people talk in. It's true, it's true. Somebody's, somebody's, somebody's nodding. I know it's old. Yeah, I know, I know. There's, n there's none of us in the condition we were, are there? Let's be honest. Um, but again, what an important part of the history and the identity of WA. And, you know, you can't do this stuff without the original material. And this is my contention. So having said at the beginning, I don't believe that the material is necessarily the core business. I absolutely do believe it's critical to what we do, and it's critical to understanding the world. A um, couple of other moments in, uh, uh, I guess, moving up to the, the, the colonization stage now. Um, the, the dry blower from Kalgoorlie, um, something invented in the gold fields uh, to separate the gold from the uh, residue around it. And important because, of course, um, long before C.Y. O'Connor, uh, water was at a bit of a premium in the gold fields. So using uh, water-based uh, methods of separating gold was not really an option, and that's why the, the dry blower was invented. And then on the right-hand side, the, uh, the convict chain gang uniform. This is, um, I always tease uh, our colleague Anne Delroy about this because she always likes showing people the, the leg irons when, uh, uh, when she takes people around the store. I'm sure she'd like to see me in a pair of them, but that's, uh, that's another story. Um, 
but um, just five pieces of clothing survive uh, from the convict period in Western Australia. And this jacket and trousers are two of those. And it was worn as extra punishment uh, by prisoners who were sentenced to work in leg chains. So actually, if you, you can't really see it on there, but the, the legs have got sort of button-up bits, which is not a fashion accessory, so you can actually button them and unbutton them around the, the leg irons. Um, and of course, these rather bizarre colours that would immediately identify you if you were to, uh, to escape. And uh, they are actually stamped with the infamous uh, broad arrow uh, of British uh, government property. And again, an important uh, item in our history, an important thing that reminds us that although uh, WA wasn't a convict colony per se, it certainly uh, had its fair share over about an 18-year period, which allowed us to uh, build the colony up. I mentioned Dwyer before um, and the collection uh, of photographs that is really, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these photographs or some of them, they're a fantastic record of life in the gold fields at the time. Um, Kalgoorlie was, you know, was a really buzzing place at the time. I think it was the, the first place to have, uh, is it right, it was the first town in Australia to have electric lighting, I think, Kalgoorlie. It really was um, a, a, a happening place. And Dwyer's photographs, uh, I think this was uh, election night. Um, um, I'll tell you what, there's a, a good thing in Australia, of course, is that you know, voting is obligatory, but uh, you wouldn't see that on an election night in the UK at the moment. Um, um, the political process is so uh, um, so discredited that uh, apparently now we get far more votes for our um, TV reality programs. Like, uh, uh, I can't. I think there's a version of Dancing with the Stars gets more votes than uh, people vote in the general election now. So that's a uh, a sign of the times. But anyway, not so in Kalgoorlie. People were out there. They wanted to know what was happening uh, on election night. And uh, this is an interesting um, uh, project. Um, this, is, um, this is something we did with uh, ABC Open and uh, basically encouraged people to go uh, with a, a historic photograph and take a contemporary photograph and compare them. And uh, it, it actually, say, so worked with the ABC. Uh, it was a big online project and uh, certainly was very, very popular. It was called Now and Then. Uh, it was a national project, but it was great to, to see things like this. And again, obviously, something like the, the super pit has seen a fair few changes over that period. Um, some collections. I should have said at the beginning, and I would, will say it anyway, I, I do want to thank all my colleagues because uh, so many people have given me so much stuff to talk about. Um, the downside of that is some of you will be disappointed because it didn't all get in. Um, and maybe all of you will be disappointed because you know, we probably won't finish till about 9 o'clock because a lot of it did get in. Um, but uh, when I, I, I sort of did this, I'll, I'll put it all in and edit it back. Uh, and by the time I'd done that, I had 160 slides, so you'd be glad to know I did actually edit it back from there. Um, but some of the, the collections uh, come to us in odd ways, and some seem personal and prosaic, but often these are imbued with the most powerful stories. Um, on the right-hand side there, is that screen all right with these lights on? I suddenly noticed that... Can anybody do anything about the lights? Oh. Yes? It's, it's, it's that one there. It's the one that shines... Ah, oh, that's better. That has two... That's much better because you can see more of the screen and less of me. I prefer both of those things. Um, so, I say, some of these uh, collections are imbued with the most powerful stories. And on the right-hand side there is a, a gentleman called Lionel Graham who was a carpenter in WA in Pemberton uh, during the Second World War. Now, obviously, during the, the war, uh, imports to Australia were disrupted. This caused a sh and there was obviously a shift of production uh, from de domestic goods to make wartime materials. And toys and other childhood items were among the luxuries, which obviously disappeared from the shops. So Lionel, the carpenter, started making toys from found materials for Christmas and birthday gifts for his son, uh, one of whom is Colin, who's sat on one of them there. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, requests poured in from extended family and friends. And gradually, he just became the sort of toy maker of, of Pemberton and the region. And people would come from all over, from uh, management, from Northcliffe, from all over the southwest to come and get his toys. So it was um, 
uh, apparently uh, you know, white ants got into them and a lot of them were thrown away but uh, luckily for us um, uh, this is one of a, a, a few that were actually rescued from a tip um, uh, near Pemberton uh, from somebody who thought you know why are those being thrown out, brought them in. We didn't actually know what they were. I think they, they actually originally went to the ECU Museum. So Stephen Anstey, um, who, who is on our staff now, was at um, the uh, Museum of Childhood at uh, ECU. And uh, after a bit of detective work, um, it was discovered that this was, in fact, one of Lionel's um, uh, creations. And again, personal stories, but very much indicative of, of a time. The other important thing, of course, is keeping up to date. Um, and uh, I think uh, I wasn't around at the time, but I suspect uh, the government probably got a little bit rattled when somebody said we're going to be acquiring a helicopter. Um, but actually, this is the, the helicopter that we acquired. And this is called uh, Jandamara Crossing. And this is uh, a piece that was created um, by Aboriginal people in the Kimberley working with a, a, an artist in residence. And many of you know the story of, of, of Jandamara, who was uh, originally kind of uh, enlisted by the local police um, to uh, assist with uh, meeting out uh, justice, uh, particularly uh, to Aboriginal groups, but uh, uh, realized that uh, you know, he was really working against his people and pretty much uh, uh, mutinied and became a real thorn in the side of the authorities uh, in, in the Kimberley. And uh, he was actually called Pigeon because he, um, they could never find him. It was like he flew from one place to the other. And so the inspiration for this. And it's a fantastic piece. I mean, you can see the, the, the kind of skids. The feet are actually made of emu feet there. Um, the case of the, the helicopter is made of crushed uh, emu beer cans. And there's all sorts of um, references in here about contemporary issues uh, in Aboriginal communities in the Kimberley as well. It's a very important way of ensuring that our collections stay fresh. Um, and also, right just at the moment, we've just um, acquired on loan at the moment with a view to create an exhibition, a large uh, collection of material from um, uh, the late uh, actor, WA actor Heath Ledger, uh, certainly one of WA's most celebrated personalities. And we, I say we hope that that will help us uh, create an exhibition. This is actually a, a painting that we showed last year by uh, Vincent Fantoso, a kind of triptych of, of Heath. So that was all about being Western Australian. And there could have been so much more. It's all on the cutting room floor. I apologize for, to those who sent things. Um, so what about discovering Western Australia? I say it's the second pillar. It's about being a gateway to this extraordinary state. Uh, one that the museum itself is so involved in actually the discovery of. And with its ancient landscape, its evident, earliest evidence of life on Earth, its unrivaled biodiversity in many ways, this is an extraordinary place and the museum is well placed to um, investigate it and present it. Um, again, how do, you, how do you pick from so many things? How many species every year die? About 100 terrestrial, probably about 100 marine new species every year discovered uh, just by our staff in WA. Um, so it is difficult to pick. And it's a probably, um, this, this, I guess, has to be one of our most celebrated uh, fossils. And these are the, what I call secrets in the stones. This is on the Gogo station, also in the, the Kimberley. And um, these nodules are picked up. as uh, thousands of them there still. Um, and if you know what you're doing, if you're a, a, a geologist, um, a conservation geologist, you can start to develop these, probably using something like acetic acid, uh, to, out of these Devonian uh, nodules, to start to um, find what's actually inside. And what tends to be inside are these skulls of these um, bony, uh, armored fish, a very um, characteristic of the Devonian period. And when it's fully uh, developed like that, you actually get the skulls out of them. And what's really almost unique about these is, you know, fossils tend to be formed, obviously, in sedimentary conditions. They're crushed. They're flat. Most things, you get a sort of, um, you know, a flat pack version of what the, uh, the animal or the plant looked like in real life. Uh, these, absolutely not. You get the full 3D effect, and they are absolutely unique. Um, this uh, is probably... Um, 
almost our most famous, and I'll come on to that later. This, is the, this was actually adopted as the official state fossil emblem of uh, Western Australia. I can never say it. I try so hard. McNamara Spis. Uh, it seems to have one too few vowels in there, but there we are. Um, Keprius, uh, named after Ken McNamara, who was one of the, the staff here, and he's back in WA at the moment, um, but one of the staff here uh, at the museum, named by his colleague, uh, John Long, also one of the staff here. And these are absolutely of international importance and fame. They also happen to be David Attenborough's favorite thing in Western Australia. Um, and uh, I'll maybe talk a bit more about that later. That will be about quarter to nine. I'll get on to that in a bit. Um, uh, the marsupial megafauna. Uh, coming from the northern hemisphere, as I do, um, you know, I'm very familiar with the ideas of woolly mammoths and rhinoceroses and saber-toothed cats and all that kind of thing, which were the, um, the kind of Pleistocene fauna of um, the northern hemisphere. Australia had its own equivalent of that and they were all marsupials and you probably all know about them but believe me the world doesn't know about them and this is a fantastic story to be told here and um, the diprotodons these enormous wombat like things that used to lumber around um, were preyed upon by things like uh, uh, Thylacoleo carnifex which uh, I got really told off the other day because I called it you know, I said, it's called the marsupial lion, and somebody jumped down my throat and said, it's not a lion. I know it's not a lion, but that's what we call it because it was a, a, a predator. But it's not a lion, it's not a cat, it's a marsupial. Um, but uh, these are found in the Nullarbor Caves. Uh, the WA Museum has the only complete skeleton, one, uh, skeleton of one in existence, as far as I'm aware. And again, the work that can be done on these, uh, more and more becomes possible as um, the, uh, the techniques improve. Um, really getting behind time now. Um, a lot of our work, led by Di Jones and her team, relates to uh, statutory environmental assessment. Um, as Di knows, I always like to say when people say, what do those people do? I say they're saving the world. That is what they're doing. They're finding out uh, what uh, we didn't know was there, what is there. Um, often, not only do they find what is there, but they find things we've never seen before. And these are the new species that, as I said, are, are named uh, and described on an annual basis, uh, literally by the dozen. Um, this is one, uh, this is a, a pseudoscorpion. Um, they've all got horrible names, these. Sin Sinsferonus, Christopher Darwinii, um, which is obviously named after uh, Darwin's great grandson in his honor. And then, just to, yes, it's coming up. Um, does anybody know what that one's called? Yeah, we'll give you that. Well, actually, nobody knows what it's called yet because it's the first one that's ever been found. Um, it's a, a trapdoor spider that was uh, brought in. Um, to, or has it got a, has it got a name yet? No, he hasn't got. I didn't think he got a name. Yeah, phew. Thought, thought I was going to be corrected then for a moment. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been called the albino spider because it's got some white on it, but it's not albino at all. In no sense is it albino. It's just got a, a white cephalothorax. Um, but it, it, it rose to fame last year because uh, it, it actually was number three in uh, National Geographic's Weird Animals of the Year. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's certainly gone a long way. But again, the important point is uh, Mark Harvey, who uh, uh, heads up our terrestrial zoology team, um, is an arachnologist, so he knows a fair bit about these things. But he's also the master of understatement. Um, he described this as, yeah, they're really quite, quite rare. Uh, it is the only one that's ever been found, but, uh, <laughs> but there we go. Um, and... Yeah, this is important in all sorts of ways. This is um, the, the Western rock lobster, the mainstay of a huge uh, economic fishery, of course, off the Western Australian coast. And on the left-hand side, and again, I, I'm, I'm on shaky ground here because Di Jones is an absolute expert in crustaceans, um, but um, there are many things that kind of look similar, but they're not the same, and they, and they don't taste the same. Uh, and they don't look the same. Uh, so the original uh, Western lock, robs, lock can't even say it, rock lobster, uh, Panularis cygnus, uh, was actually named uh, by the Western Australian Museum, 1963, I think it was. It was recognised as, a, as a, a, a separate species, 
And in the left hand of that picture is the type specimen, which is in the museum. And whenever you discover a new species um, of animal, you have to name the specimen that you've, you've actually described the name from. And that becomes the irrefutable evidence of it. Everybody in the world has to go back if they either want to question that or if they want to split that group into more species or if they want to suggest that actually it was really something else. That is the only one. God forbid if anything happened to that. You can't replace it. That is it. That is the type specimen. And it is the highest uh, kind of uh, value of, of uh, zoological material that you can get. How many have we got die? Type specimens? Thousands. Thousands. That's the importance of the collections that we have here. Something maybe, well, probably not more familiar than a Western lo rock lobster with Christmas coming, but even so, the... Um, uh, the cockatoos um, that you will read uh, constantly about in the newspapers uh, get us into a lot of trouble sometimes uh, when, uh, when our colleague Ron gets a bit, bit excitable about, uh, about some of these things. And, but um, th I, do, I, I don't know if anybody else is good at that. I mean, you know, when you see them there, like, um, you know, close up, uh, bodans, the, the bodans, and this one on the right-hand side is carnabies because it's got the shorter bill. Um, it's very, very difficult for people like me to tell in the wild. They do have a different call as well. But carnabies in particular is in uh, some danger. It's uh, a particular Western Australian uh, speciality. And again, the work that's going on in the museum is, is very much geared towards understanding the ecology, um, the behavior of these species, uh, and indeed the taxonomy. And in fact, um, Funnily enough, only yesterday, I, just, I was at a conference over East with the, the director of um, uh, National Museums of Liverpool, and uh, only today I discovered, and he discovered, because neither of us knew, that, um, that we are actually collaborating with National Museums of Liverpool because they've got a specimen of, uh, of one of these bionans uh, cockatoos that may be a different, uh, certainly a subspecies again. But this is all done through museum collections. You couldn't do it without the real stuff. Um, this is a bit more esoteric. Um, uh, I think this is a Bill Humphreys one. Uh, Lacionectes exlii. Um, and it's a, a remipede crustacean. Only Di Jones would have known that. But um, uh, it's, uh, again, was discovered, named by Bill Humphreys, our colleague in the museum in 1996. Uh, we have the type specimen and it's the only um, example of that group that lives in the Southern Hemisphere, and it was found here. And again, if we're going to understand our world, how do we do it? Working out the relationships between these, these are, um, it's important to know who's related to whom, and when in the evolutionary process they appear, this helps us sort out uh, or look at environmental stress, environmental uh, impacts. Uh, it looks, helps us look at uh, geological and geomorphological change. And these are uh, uh, geckos of the genus uh, Crenodactylus, tiny little things from the western side of, of Australia. Um, and what's going on here, again, uh, the museum, uh, Paul Doughty, our colleague, is working on these. And as you can see uh, up there, this is a sort of tree diagram working out who's related to who, where they split up, how they might have split up, whether it was down to geographic influences, whether it was down to climatic influences. This all helps us understand our world. And um, we talked a lot about, uh, about new species, which is very exciting. We also get new things that shouldn't be here uh, appearing. So uh, we get invasions of um, alien species. And this is the, you know, you know how kind of parochial we can get over here. This is the eastern Australian scallop, um, which is, oh, dear me, uh, which has started uh, appearing uh, over here. And one of many species, I guess, that um, partly because um, of the uh, movement of shipping between uh, the East Coast and Fremantle, and possibly partly because of other reasons as well, these things are starting to spread, and obviously they become um, or can become a threat to our native species. Our third pillar is exploring the world. Um, this is very important to me. I don't think... Um, there are many Australian museums that do this really well. This could be our unique selling point in Australia, actually looking out uh, to the world and becoming something where we re are creating something where the museum really does start to introduce the world to, to WA and, uh, and WA to the world. 
and probably worth starting off with um, the fact that, um, you know, I love throwing out these, uh, th th these statements like WA is the oldest place in the world. Well, that's a bit of a silly statement, but it's got the oldest rocks in the world. And these zircon crystals from the Kimberley, again, we've got uh, uh, examples uh, in the museum collection, have been studied. And I don't know how they do this. Maybe somebody here does. But it's been worked out they're 4.4 billion years old. The Earth is supposed to have formed 4.5 billion years ago. So they're 4.4, 4.5. They are the oldest uh, rocks, crystals known on the planet. And they're in museum collections. Uh, if they weren't there, if we didn't have the opportunity to study them, how would we know? Um, Although where possible, obviously Aboriginal rock art should be left in situ. Uh, again, there are occasions where in the past it's been removed from country. It needs uh, saving, it needs rescuing, and again, collections in the museum preserve this. WA probably and unarguably, uh, in terms of its rock art, its rock art is on a scale and significance. Nowhere else will you find that in the world. Um, there's more rock art in the Kimberley than, I mean, the, the, the rock art that everybody's probably familiar with from the books um, in southern France, it, it can't really hold a candle to this in terms of the, the extent of it. Uh, it it's a real uh, unique element of WA's cultural history, and it's something that we need to preserve. Oh, here's something closer to home again, the Batavia. Um, the second oldest shipwreck in Australian waters, allegedly. Who knows? We might find another one, might we, one day. Um, but um, this is obviously, if you've not seen it, if you've not been to the Shipwrecks Museum, the, the old Maritime Museum, just uh, about, I don't know, what, four, six hundred metres away from here on Cliff Street, please go along. Uh, this is the most uh, complete reconstruction of original um, uh, materials of a Dutch East Indiaman in the world. And uh, again, uh, by being able to work with the original timbers, uh, just imagine what secrets they can give up. And I've done something strange with that photograph. Sorry, Pat, that might have been one of yours. I've ruined there by making it too, too light. Um, but uh, the objects that come from the um, Batavia, was that the bronze astrolabe um, here? help us, or help help those people, people like Myra, um, work out that it really was the Batavia. So uh, on that, you can see uh, when it's cleaned up and studied um, the mark of the VOC in Amsterdam, the Dutch East India Company. And then up there, you can see the date, 1628, which was the year before she was wrecked. So these are the kind of things that help confirm uh, the identity of these shipwrecks. Where are they? They're in museums. Who's looking after them? Who's conserving them? Who's developing them so we can find these things? Museums. Oh dear, look at the time. Um, I'm going to skid past that one. I have to put that in. Vision, Visions of the Wonderful is, is, is the title of a, a recent book about um, uh, uh, Philip Henry Goss, who was a, a naturalist of some uh, repute in Devon who um, studied marine organisms. And this is... Uh, uh, this is one of our colleagues, Jane Froman, and that thing she's holding in her hand, which looks like a very long longbow, is actually a glass spicule that was formed at about 900 meters depth by a sponge. Who on earth ever seen anything like that before? I hadn't. It's, it's sort of my current favorite object in the collection. I, I'm very, um, you, you know, I, I sort of, I'll, I'll change. I'm, I'm fickle. I'll have something else there, but... Uh, there's a bit of a close-up on the right-hand side where you can see the actual, the actual sponge bit there. How do these things do that? And how would we know? These are now being studied in the museum. Um, we also have an important role to play in not only conservation of the environment, but, um, or out there in the environment, but combating illegal trade. And these are some of the things that we have in our collection, which will have actually been seized uh, by customs. And these are all... Uh, all made of elephant, so elephant ivory, uh, African elephant skin briefcase, Asian elephant shoes there. Uh, obviously, for conservation reasons, these are 
um, that trade in these is prohibited and the museum is often called in to identify material like that. Um, we'll move past that as well because we're running out of time. Um, I, there's a couple of times I'll refer to the universe here. I'll, I'll maybe, maybe pick up. But, you know, what is... We talked about contemporary collecting. We talked about Jandamara Cross, and we talked about Heath Ledger. You know, what is the big event that happened this year, uh, or one of the big events that happened this year? Uh, WA was selected as one of the co-centers for the Square Kilometre Array for the massive radio telescope that will help us um, uh, understand the heavens uh, much more than we have before. Again, I, I find it difficult talking about this because when you talk to the guys, they talk about how big the computers are going to be to collect all this data. And it's actually going to be bigger than all the computers in the world just to collect this data. And I sort of can't get my head around that. But this has been a, a project on the uh, books for such a long time. And it's really amazing that WA has uh, achieved um, the, the success of being part of that. Uh, this will be up in the Murchison. And this, I was very proud that I collected this. Um, and this is the, um, uh, one of the uh, antennae ranges, uh, which is uh, one of the precursors for the square kilometre array. Um, I did ask first. I didn't just go up in the Murchison and, and, and sort of steal it, in case you're thinking. Um, I might have done. I might have. <laughs> Good point. Um, so, can collections change the world? Well, what do you think my answer to that is? Uh, yes, obviously they can. And um, this is, uh, this is a, bit of, a bit of a sort of uh, works on all, all levels, this, actually. These are the um, stromatolites that uh, WA is famous for. So on the, on the left-hand side, living, breathing stromatolites. Stromatolites are these um, sort of concretionary um, uh, processes that are, that are built up and... Uh, at the centre of these are living cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, something that people sometimes call them. They're actually a, a bacteria. Um, and they create these amazing little domes. And I say, if you go up to Shark Bay, you'll have seen these. Clifton Pool, there's uh, some uh, thrombolites down south of here. Cervantes, there's, there's um, um, And they're really, really interesting. And there aren't many in the world. And these are the living ones. But actually, if you go up into the Pilbara, um, or actually much easier if you go into the museum store, um, you will find fossil stromatolites. Uh, these appear to be something like 3.5 billion years old. These are, as far as we're aware at the moment, the oldest evidence of life on Earth. And they're sitting in our collections and studied in our collections. So I think that's world-changing because that makes us think about you know, the age of the earth. It makes us think about the age of life and it, it helps us move that on. But actually, actually, these really were world-changing because these were probably some of the first, or, well, they are, they say the earliest evidence of life on earth that we've got. First organisms on the planet would have started to create oxygen. First thing that did was bind up all the iron that was floating around in, the, in, in various compounds in the water. So the whole economy of... WA in terms of the, uh, the iron um, extraction is probably down to these guys. Uh, but of course, once they'd banned up all the iron, then the oxygen went into the atmosphere. And these are the things that actually created an oxygen-rich atmosphere which, people, which life could move out onto the land. So actually, they really did change the world. Um, but also, uh, thinking about, again, um, you know, the importance of our, and the age of our uh, civilization, our Aboriginal civilization, these pierced shells uh, from Mandamanda Creek near Exmouth are, again, some of the earliest uh, body ornamentation made by humans anywhere in the world. Um, and it, if we start to think about how humans grew and changed and why did they start wearing ornamentation, uh, and I say you would be hard-pressed to find much that's actually older than that in terms of pure ornamentation. Um, going international for a while, um, our friends at the British Museum, on the left-hand side, of course, the Rosetta Stone. Um, Far Lap is the most popular exhibit in the Melbourne Museum. The Rosetta Stone is the most popular exhibit in the British Museum. Draw what comparisons you will from that. 
Um, but obviously, the thing about the Rosetta Stone, uh, it was inscribed with a decree in Memphis in 196 uh, BC. Um, and it's written in three languages. It's written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, it's written in Demotic script, and it's written in ancient Greek. And obviously, because it was written in ancient Greek, it provided the key to translating so much Egyptian uh, hieroglyphic and Demotic script from, from before that time. It's changed the world. How would we have understood that without it? On the right-hand side, sorry guys, I know a lot of you have heard me talk about this before, but uh, this, I think, is a really important piece. And it was important to us because it was, if you like, the, the hero image for our Extraordinary Stories exhibition. First time the British Museum had ever lent it, uh, and it came here. Um, and it's uh, a bronze head sculpture from Nigeria. And it... <laughs> It changed, well, when it was made about 700 years ago in Ife, in Nigeria, it's interesting. Neil McGregor writes of it. Um, it's quite clearly the portrait of a person, but we don't know who. It's without question by a very great artist, but we don't know who. And it must have been made for a ceremony, but we don't know what. Uh, but what is certain uh, is that it's, uh, it's African, it's royal, and it epitomizes the great medieval civilizations of Africa at that time. And when this and 12 others were found in uh, 1938, um, the German archaeologist Leo Frobenius uh, refused to believe that it could have been made by Africans because Africa was the savage continent. Uh, Africans couldn't possibly have been capable of making something so beautiful um, by this lost wax method. Of course, subsequently, it proved it was. Africa was having its own renaissance at that time. And it actually changed the way the world thought about Africans. Um, other things, just randomly selected from places I've been recently. So the Southern Cross flag uh, from, the, <laughs> from the Eureka Stockade at Ballarat. Such an important moment uh, in Australian uh, labor history, in Australian civil rights. On the right-hand side, the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, the document which sets out the rights of uh, Maori and uh, Pakeha uh, people in New Zealand, and even now is the subject of well, is the subject of redisplay. It was actually redisplayed this week in the National Library uh, in Wellington, um, but it also uh, continues to resonate uh, with a, a, a Waitangi uh, a Treaty Commission that continues to hear the cases of Maori Iwi. Um, from our collection, uh, a uniform worn by Stefan Gebski, uh, a Polish political prisoner uh, who was uh, in a number of concentration camps uh, with the Nazis in the Second World War. Um, amazingly, he survived. One of the one in three people that survived um, the concentration camps. And he came to WA. And he continued to wear this um, uniform for some years because actually he had nothing. This was one of the few bits of clothing that he had. He continued to wear it. But of course, when he didn't have to wear it anymore, he thought it was important to, to keep it, to remind us of what had gone before. I'm really losing it in terms of the timing here. I have to go really fast. Um, so environmental quality. Um, so much that we're doing here. I've picked a British example here because it's such a celebrated one. This is the, the famous peppered moth. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Biston betularia. And the point about this is on the left hand side is a nice lichen covered tree trunk and on the right hand side is a sooty covered tree trunk uh, due to the sort of industrial pollution uh, in northern England. Uh, the peppered moth should look like the uh, white one there or actually it should look like that one there. Uh, because it's so brilliantly camouflaged against its background. But again, by looking at museum collections over many years, uh, it was realized that the population changed um, or swayed massively in favor of this dark uh, melanic form, because, of course, these were much better camouflaged against the, uh, the polluted uh, tree trunks of North, uh, northern England. And this was the one of many, uh, I, I suppose, stimuli to really start dealing with the issues of industrial pollution in the UK. Um, egg collections are always a little bit uh, 
contentious. Um, but Di Jones has a good phrase. What is it? Our collections are there to answer the questions we haven't thought of yet, or something like that. We have, we have yet to ask. You put it so much here, so much uh, more eloquently. Um, nobody knew when they were collecting, because egg collecting is a pretty sort of a despicable um, thing to do in this day and age. But nobody knew that the egg collections in the UK would prove uh, to be the, uh, the catalyst to understand the terrible damage that organochlorine pesticides like DDT were wreaking. And what happened was, by measuring, uh, these are actually kestrel eggs, but the thickness of the, uh, what was happening is the birds of prey, which were across the top of the food chain where all these uh, pesticides were being concentrated, their breeding success was plummeting. And it turned out it was the, uh, the thickness of the eggshells was getting thinner and thinner, and basically the, the young just weren't making it through. And the reason behind that was the organochlorines. And this was a famously celebrated in Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which was probably one of the, um, I suppose, the, the standards of the uh, environmental generation. I'd better put a WA example in, which is, of course is the Numbat, uh, another state emblem. But something else that by looking at our collections, uh, we can get a sense of where it was, uh, why it was there, what kind of life it was living. And those collections hopefully, ultimately, will help us contribute to the, um, I, I suppose, the return of the number up to something like its previous numbers. Sorry, and I did get one in. You, I had to get one in at the end. This, this, was, a, this was a question that, um, that hadn't been asked, and you can ask Ian about it later, because he'll describe it in much more uh, detail and with much more authority than I can. But this uh, is off the Xantho. This is some of the, the metalwork off the, the Xantho. Um, which was wrecked in 1872. A whole story about the Xantho. If you want to go down to the shipwrecks galleries, there's a, there's a gallery about it. You can go and see somebody turn the engine that's been uh, incredibly uh, restored there. Um, but I think I'm right in saying what we've got here are almost sort of annual rings of deposition, of, of corrosion deposition. And the punchline of this is that this was happening about every seven years. Is that right? This was at Port Gregory. And as a result of that, Ian was able to demonstrate that um, this silting up occurred about every seven years, and it was an absolutely inappropriate place uh, to develop uh, a deep water port, which is what they were looking at at the time. So the whole development was uh, predicated on this, and, and who would have known that the Xantho, the wreck of the Xantho, would have given us that insight? Um, transforming lives. I believe we do transform lives. Oh, this is my, my subtitle for this, The Power of Goo. Because um, that looks like some goo in a jar there. Um, and actually, when you look at the living thing, it doesn't look much better. Um, but it's actually a sponge. Back to Jane Fromont again. Um, uh, a Haliclona species. And it's only been found in southwestern Australia. We think it's endemic. Um, and it produces um, a compound called salicylhalamide. Um, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with salicylic acid, which is aspirin. Uh, and this has a unique chemical makeup uh, which inhibits um, one of the enzymes in uh, mammalian uh, uh, cells. Um, and the activity that that enzyme, which is uh, mammalian vacuole ATPase, uh, is implicated in osteoporosis, renal disease, HIV infection, and tumor uh, metastasis. This could be the next wonder drug. Who knows? And we've got a whole collection of uh, species, particularly of sponge, deep frozen, just waiting for the opportunity for people to study these. This is the power of collections. I had to put this in. Um, J.D. Hill used this photograph in his talk, and I, I found it on the web. Um, this is the power of collections. Who would have thought? There's Neil McGregor in the back with the sort of case going through the middle of his nose there. Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum. Who would have thought that the director of the British Museum um, would have been there um, uh, in Tehran with uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, uh, not known for his uh, sort of uh, um, kind of a generous attitude towards the West, as it were, uh, even being persuaded to point in that way that museum people point uh, at an object. And this is the uh, Cyrus cylinder from the British Museum, which was loaned uh, to Tehran. Uh, where I think um, something like two million people went to see it in a very short amount of time. 
which is such an important piece, again, in the history uh, of Iran. Um, international diplomacy, it's something we do. There's another universe thing. Renee Woodhams, who I work with, always accuses me of hyperbole, because I say, it's the oldest in the world, it's the biggest, it's the very... So now we're, we're searching for the keys of the universe now. We've gone beyond the world. And this is the uh, Desert Fireball Network uh, in WA. And this is, uh, again, something that we're a partner in. Uh, tracking uh, meteorites as they come through the atmosphere, picking them up uh, and working out where they've come from. And uh, the output, this is a partnership with Curtin University, with Imperial College in London and with an observatory in Prague. And through this, we will get a much better sense of the origin of the universe, in fact. Do we still need collections? Nearly there, guys. Um, the digital question. Um, the, I don't want to snitch, but our treasury um, said when we set out on the path of the new museum, why do you need a museum? Because everything's digital now, isn't it? So that's all right then. We don't need a museum. You know what I say? I say, DNA test that. Um, Assay that. The coins from the gilt dragon on the uh, left there that are being um, tested really to find out which mints they've come from, where they've come from. Right hand side a caryatid from the Zadru, um, which again will help us find out where the timber came from, how old it was. You can't actually do that with a digital image. Um, what's going on here, Ian? This, these were coins that were found to be short on silver. I believe you made some outrageous uh, suggestion that Philip of Spain was shortchanging people by forging coins. State forgery. It's an outrage. You couldn't do that with a digital image. This, this is a, anybody know who that is? Correct. The light's a bit of a, bit of a clue, isn't it? Bit of a clue. What did Edison do? <laughs> no, I wasn't around then, Pat. <laughs> Go on, indulge me. He invented the light bulb. Yes, but also other things like the... Uh, we, we, uh, you know, he did the, you know, the... I can't even think. The, yeah, <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. What would you call it? Phonograph. Phonograph, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, as somebody who worked in North East England and um, held a collection of light bulbs, I can tell you categorically that Edison didn't invent the light bulb. Uh, this guy invented the light bulb. Um, uh, Joseph Swan of Gateshead. He invented the light bulb a year before Edison invented it, but he didn't get his patent out, and a year later Edison invented his along similar principles. And there are uh, Joseph Swan's light bulbs in the Discovery Museum in Newcastle. There then followed, you might imagine, a long legal patent dispute, but in fact neither uh, Edison tried to sue him but didn't win, and they actually, although they never met, they jointly formed the Ediswan light bulb company. Do you like that? Eddie Swan. Um, but the important thing about that is it was a museum collection, again, that can actually determine what the true course of history was. What about this one? This, uh, this, is, this is one still to be solved. Two um, strapping young men there, uh, Max Kramer, the late Max Kramer, and Hugh Edwards with the elephant tusk uh, off the wreck of the Zavig, or is it? Uh, and uh, again, those who know know that there wasn't supposed to be elephant ivory on the Zavig. Um, was it smuggled on? That's been the theory for a long time. But there's also a theory that maybe there was another wreck there. Uh, one of the things we'll be able to do with this is actually DNA uh, sequence it in our new DNA lab because we've got the collection. Um, more invaders, the Asian paddle crab. Can you eat those, Daiho? They just... Uh, Oh, well, so there's some good in them. But they shouldn't be here, should they? They've invaded, and uh, they're obviously a threat to our native species, again, identified in the museum. And, of course, the idea of rediscovering extinct species, the, uh, the thylacine. I didn't actually show our mummified one, but, it, again, I don't know if we'd ever get DNA out of that. I don't see why not, to be honest, if, if need be. Yeah. Back to the go-go fish. Why are the go-go fish so important? Um, our colleague Mikael is very, I mean, he accuses me of hyperbole. And then he says, it's the first evidence of sex. 
it's, it's not actually the first evidence of sex, if I may say so. There was sex before go-go fish. Um, but through the study of these nodules and the fish, um, eventually somebody found embryos, and in fact this is a fossilized umbilical cord. This means the first evidence of live birth in vertebrates, the, the oldest vertebrate embryo in the world, a hugely important step in the evolutionary process. Uh, that's why David Attenborough loves the go-go fish so much. That's why they featured in his Life on Earth program. And that's why uh, Matapiscus, that's easier to say than Matanamaraspis, um, uh, Attenborough uh, was named in his honor. Um, uh, Alex Bevan, one of our colleagues, is very fond of, of pulling these out. Yeah. Well, look what have I got in my hand. Oh, a bit of Mars, a bit of the moon. These have come um, from meteorites. And, you know, at the moment, until, until we actually have samples collected on Mars, this is pretty much all we've got to go on. Um, I'm going to finish, almost, I really am going to finish now, uh, emotional ties. We've talked about science, we've talked about the environment, we've talked about all the ways in which museum collections can uh, help us understand the world. But we've been doing quite a bit of research lately into our exhibitions, and, you know, the, the thing that really comes through all the time. People think they might come for one reason, but actually when you say, what did you get out of it? It's almost always an emotional experience, and collections can be hugely emotional. Uh, this is another one from my past. This is the Lindisfarne Gospels, which is an illuminated uh, script. Um, absolutely beautiful uh, and iconic piece that uh, sits in the British Library. Um, on rare occasions, they lend it to northeast England, which is where it was supposedly created on the island of Lindisfarne by monks. And it really is one of the treasures of the British Isles. And the British Library don't really like lending it to those kind of uh, rough northerners um, because, you know, we might, we might have seized it or might have damaged it or something. So they produce these beautiful facsimiles. Have a facsimile. Well, actually, no, it's not the same. Uh, they produced a beautiful digital, what they call turning the pages, where you can actually go and look at each page. It's beautiful, but it's not the same as the real thing. Um, when we borrowed it the last time, I watched people weeping in front of this. I don't think I've ever seen anybody weep in front of an iPad. Well, except when it's broken or something. Um, <laughs> or when I can't get it to work. Um, but seriously, that is the power of real things with real associations. And I wanted to finish just with, with two things that don't even belong to us, but the projects that we've been involved with um, over the last year. Um, for the 70th anniversary of the sinking of HMAS Sydney, um, there was some work done with families, relatives, friends, friends of friends, um, who came back to Geraldton. And they created little storyboards. Um, and this was one with a woman created and did some writing uh, around it uh, for Lieutenant Eric uh, Mayo, who went down with the Sydney, and she actually brought this. I get a bit emotional with this, actually, um, which is just shows you the power of collections. Um, this was a letter that was sent by Mayo's wife, this woman's grandmother, um, to Lieutenant Mayo. It never got to him because the Sydney went down, so it was returned to sender. Um, it's never been opened probably never will be opened. Um, the granddaughter thinks it's the letter, follow me with this one, that her, her mother sent, no, sorry, her grandmother sent to her husband to say that she was pregnant with this woman's father because it would... And the kind of poignancy of something like that, it, it's almost impossible to, to countenance. And to me, I just think, you know, anybody who says that real things don't matter, real things do matter and they do have an emotional attachment. And the final one, which again will be familiar to many of you, um, this um, chap here, Keith Hayes, he's something like 93 now, he's still knocking around WA, and he's, he looks a bit of a cheeky chap here. Uh, he's in the second, second commandos um, second, um, from WA, uh, and these were the guys in East Timor in the Second World War, and they were the ones who held off, I mean, a couple of hundred of them held off thousands of Japanese forces for months on end. Um, 
and Keith was one of those. Uh, and we did an exhibition about it. And uh, Keith lent us something that, again, I don't think he's ever let out of his possession since he had it. And the exhibition was what you might... It was called Debt of Honor because of the debt that um, Peter Cosgrove actually said that the Australians owed to the Timorese. Um, and it had all the usual things. It had military in it. It had uniforms. It had guns. Um, but it had this pink handkerchief. And it was, to me, the most poignant object in the, the exhibition. Uh, it was on loan to us. It doesn't belong to us. Keith lent it to us. His most precious possession. Keith was on a a ration truck that went down into Timor. It was ambushed by the Japanese and taken over. Um, He and three of his colleagues, uh, including three in that photograph, were thrown off the truck and told to walk behind. And then some Dutch soldiers fired on it. And as a reprisal, the Japanese shot and bayoneted the four um, Australian soldiers and left them for dead. Um, Three of them were dead. Keith wasn't. He somehow crawled into the undergrowth and was taken in by this woman, uh, Berta Martinez. And she, using all her local knowledge, staunched his wounds, stopped them getting infected. Somehow, after a few days of nursing him, got him back to his regiment. Um, He lived to tell the tale. He's still alive today. Uh, She gave him that handkerchief. And the reason I get emotional about this is because I saw Keith on the night of this, and it was the first time I think he'd really talked about this. And, and, you know, understandably, he was quite upset, quite emotional. But what a powerful object. What a story that lies behind a very prosaic and simple-looking object. And to me, that's kind of what we're all about. We're about saving the world. We're about understanding the universe And we're about uh, trying to understand history. But above all, we're about these emotional ties that make us human, actually. And I think very late, that's where I'd like to finish.